All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays in the barn, but not today. We're going to let it all out for you guys. Today is going to be a Q&A episode. So if you guys want your answer, if you want your questions answered on the show, you can submit them and email them to us at barntalkshow at gmail.com. But before we get into it, you guys know the drill. If you're new to the show, um, we have this thing where, you know, if you get any value from the show, you share it out with who you know more that you guys do that, the more the show grows, the more credibility we get, the better guests we can have on, the more episodes we can make. Um, or you can also support us and buy some of our some some of our meat from farmergrade.com. It's a direct to consumer meat business we started in 2023 and uh, that also helps us out tremendously and supports us here at Barn Talk as well. So, um, last thing you can do if you want to support the show is you can leave a review on Spotify or Apple. Um, the more you guys do that, the more credible our show looks, the more guests we can get on, the better guests we can get on. So it's a win-win all around. Pick one, pick one or the th- one of those three things, and it'll help us out tremendously. As long as you get value, but I promise you probably will. Dad or I will say some dumb shit that'll make you probably laugh. And value can come in a lot Wisdom. of ways. Wisdom it can come in a lot of ways. You can learn something. You can laugh. You can learn and laugh. You can learn and laugh. You can relate to us on something. There's many ways of value. You can see what we say and go, hell no, there's no way that that can be true. And you can go look it up for yourself, which that's what we try to inspire people to do. And there you go. Your own research. That's value. That is value. So a lot of value going to be dropping today, I think. What's what's your motto? What's the tagline? What's the t-shirt? I don't know. You're the t-shirt. Share the show with those you know. Yeah, share the shows. Share the show with who... Share the show with who you know. Yeah. I, awesome. I think I said that. You did say that. Yeah. No, you didn't say yeah. it this time. Yeah. Uh, I just casually looked on uh, Apple the other day. I rarely check Apple. I usually check Spotify because uh, that's my preferred uh, podcast platform. spot, I guess, platform, whatever. But anyway, I checked Apple, and the uh, Secretary of Ag episode was like 136 on Apple. Wow. That's not too bad. Not too bad. Nope. There's a lot of podcasts out there. We've, I think the highest we've ever ranked on the charts for the business category is like 20, 26, 28 yep. sometime. It was a hot topic. It was a, either a hot topics or it was a guest episode. I can't remember, but it's pretty cool. I'd love to be in the top 10 someday, just casually in the top 10 with Rogan up there. And I mean, he's in a category all by himself, literally. I think like nobody even comes close. So we'll have to get him on the show. <laughs> I don't think he'll leave. <laughs> I don't think he'll leave. Yeah, probably I'd like not. to get on his show though. Yeah, just talk about modern day agriculture if he'd allow it. But I don't know. Maybe we can get on there with the with the pasture with the white oak pasture guy. Yeah, we can have a celebrity grudge match. Yeah, he's a celebrity, and you just got would a have grudge. to keep your cool. You might need a. You might not. Might need some something to keep the. I might need some. Joe would have something. Joe would have something to keep the nerves down. Probably. Why? Why Oscar? Why yeah. Oscar? What's that? Ayahuasca. Stuff? Ayahuasca. Yeah. Yeah, you could take some shrooms, maybe. I don't know. We'll have to see. I'm <laughs> waiting for the phone to ring. Anyway, <laughs> we kind of got off. Are we yeah. good? If yeah, we're good. I done? think it's time for you to do your deal and let right. everybody know how the markets are looking. Oh, the markets are trash. They're really trash. Uh, every time that I uh, do a new one and I go get the prices, I'm like, damn, this is not good. So apparently, the uh, the consensus is that the market is trying to convince people to plant something other than corn or beans. Uh, that would probably be wheat. The wheat price, I don't know, historically, is looks a little better to me than than what uh, corn and beans are because uh, corn's 406 is where it closed today. So uh, we're eerily close to, uh, you know, $3 corn instead of $4 corn instead of $5 corn. And so that's, uh, that, that's below just about anybody I know of's cost of production. Uh, and the only good bid locally is 414 at one of the feeders. Beans 1147 uh, at the river. They're 1155, and the Illinois side 1180. Bean meal's 335 dollars a ton, and I forgot to look when was the last time that bean meal was uh, that low. But my guess is it's probably been a while. 
Wheat, 583. Hogs, 8720. So uh, not great, but definitely way better than in the 60s and the 70s that they were there for a long time. And if you get out into summer, price looks better. There's a, there's a little bit of black ink out there for the hog guys. And exports are record high. So we are moving a lot of pork. Uh, I think some of these packers are are running on Saturdays now because they want to get all they can before their margin goes to crap. So uh, all good signs for the for the hog business, I guess. Cattle, 183. That shit's going That's If I looked at futures the other day, that they're saying like 192. Yeah. Looking like somewhere. I don't remember what the day was or what the month was, but... Sawyer's getting to put oh, on his uh, God. his uh, meat buying hat, and when he does, he looks at the cattle price, and it kind of makes his butthole pucker a little yeah, bit. Yeah, cattle. He's trying to figure out how I'm going to make stuff pencil on the cattle <laughs> side of thing. I'm yeah, it's yep. Uh, feeder cattle two fifty two milk. Somebody messaged us and said, "Hey, you should put milk. Get a price for milk." So uh, this is class three milk. So there's class four milk, class three milk. I would assume there's lower grade than that maybe, but the two that I found was class three and four. Class three is a little cheaper, uh, and that's 100 weight, I do believe. So $17.95 is the price of milk, and I honestly don't know if that's good or bad. Somebody can message us and tell us if that's a decent price or not. Don't know. But they anyway. Got, they got titty milk on there? Uh, these, nope, is no this breast from, milk. Is this from Utter or titties? Uh, Utter. Maybe titties is and, under the... Be clarified. <laughs> that I think you got to go to Vegas for that. Oh, that's that's what they or sell the on dark the corner. Web. They think, sell on that corner. I think. Yeah. I think somewhere on the dark web yeah. you can probably get that. Yeah. Uh, and that's not goat milk. That's a different. That price is probably outrageous. Well, it depends. That's one of those deals where whatever it costs you up front, it could cost you a hell of a lot on the back end. On the back end. Yeah. So. I don't know. Source your titties right is what it's what it comes down Boy, to. We, <laughs> we are really digressing quickly today. Uh, boy, what did you do? Have a you have a this slim is pure energy. Nerds or what? This is pure energy right here. Damn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's that's that. We'll just leave that there. Oil seventy eight bucks and change. Bitcoin fifty one thousand. Ethereum's just about three thousand. Uh, gold 2033 and I thought I would just I saw Brad Frecking put the uh, the stock quote for Beyond Meat on his uh, on his Twitter account and so I did a little looking Beyond Meat closed today at seven dollars and sixty two cents a share they have earnings coming out pretty soon the high the high for uh, Beyond Meat was on October 5th of 2020 where it was one hundred ninety four dollars a share and everybody thought that it was the uh, the hot new thing coming, and apparently, people have not—they uh, have not voted with their pocketbooks, and they're not doing very well. Not quite a penny stock yet, but seven dollars sixty-two cents. So we'll just end on that. That was real good market update. They are also on Beyond Meat. They are. I. I. I think this is true. Do your own research. I read it on Twitter, which is one notch above just straight internet, so it's got to be true. Uh, somebody said they're simplifying the recipe on the Beyond Burger. Instead of 22 ingredients now, it's like 20 ingredients. Mm. So pure, more pure. More pure. Yep. Got to gotta, gotta listen to your customers, man. Uh-huh. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad the pushback is real. Pushback is happen, happening. I don't think it's just beyond me. It's... It's everything. People are pissed. No plant-based burger available People are on fed Farm up Grade. with that shit. No. Hell no. We'll never have that option. Don't even ask me. <laughs> Don't even ask me. There's a lot of people. You'll be surprised at how many questions you get about just meat that people ask. I've yet to see that one, and I hope I never do because mm -hmm. it ain't ever happening. That ain't meat to me. All right. So great market update, and I'll just say, you know, yeah, we got off a little bit there, but that's what makes it fun. Oh, hey, I'll, one more thing. And uh, I do love titties, and I do, I'm a little frugal, so, or I'm a little, I'm a, I'm a little, um, in my personal life and with my family and who I'm comfortable with, I'm pretty, I have kind of a, what would you say? I can cross no filter. No filter, no a filter bit. whatsoever. Uh, yeah. There isn't anybody that, well, I should say Sawyer does not shy away from any subject around the dinner table. Uh, and the number of times that he has made his mother blush, uh, I, it's a lot. It's a lot. Out of there anger. is no subject 
um, in Sawyer's life that he doesn't care about sharing if he's interested with, in with the so. right people for sure. And yeah. you guys are you guys are like family, so you know I'm getting out of my shell slowly but surely here. Yeah, so, you're good. Just let you know, I do love titties. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're gonna start this off with question number one, and this is for you, Dad. So right. Travis asked. Would you ever use an AI program for your consulting needs, agronomy, nutrition, marketing, et cetera? If someone made a program that could pick your seed chemical or feed ration, would you use that over your local rep? Well, I'll give you the answer for that one. Pretty simple. If service is shit and AI gets better. I don't know. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that I would. And I also think that Let's face it, uh, I'm sure that a lot of these agronomy companies and yeah. they're going to they're gonna use it. They're going to they're figure gonna use it, it anyway because um, labor is so, labor's so stretched so thin that, you know, they're going to use, if that technology gets good enough in their business to where one guy can cover more customers, they're going to do it. Um, I feel like that's just the kind of, that's kind of like exactly the kind of uh, role where you would expect AI to take off because you've got such a, the power of that is an AI can scour all of the research data that is out there, all the plots, all the yields, all the, you know, and just literally scour that, consolidate it, boil it down. Um, somebody's got that where it can, you know, if it knows your soil type, where you're living, yeah, it's, it's a data driven, it's a data driven decision anyway. And so I just think that that's probably, uh, if it's not already here, it's, I'm sure it's coming. Yeah. I would say that's probably one of the better uses of AI. When you talk about AI and human evolution, I think AI can help us in a number of ways, not just in agriculture, but science and just a bunch of shit because it's almost like, you know, it's your helper. It's helping you analyze data and make data driven decisions. Now, is AI going to be like, is AI going to be one of these things when in 10 years, 20 years in the future where what's happened to social media happened to AI where people have their bloody hands on social media like you know like twitter where the fbi cia had access to twitter and the twitter files and there's some corrupt shit going on with these social media platforms that's all coming out is that going to be the case for ai where it's skewed data to for what they want you to see i don't know but if it's the real functioning ai that they try to tell us it is where it's there's no nobody's got control over it the data that comes out of it that's a good. That's it's a good a, use case for AI, in my opinion. If you can get a pure, a pure receipt research driven answer, uh, I think that's great use for AI. And for yeah. people that are doing research, I think it's great because you've got the ability to uh, just go through vast amount of data much faster than you could before. And biology and agronomy and all those things, I think it, I think it would suit itself to that very well. Now, what I'm not going to do is put on Apple's VR goggles and go out in my field and analyze soil types that way. You'll never catch me wearing those goofy-looking things. Yeah, I when they get those things down to where they look like my my Ray-Bans, my Wayfarers, maybe. then maybe. But I'm not I'm not into that goggle thing. I mean, not to get off, but I guy just put it one way. He's like, you know what? Are we really going to come to the a point in society where? We're literally got fucking goggles on our face walking around everywhere. Yeah. Is it? I mean, this whole technology revolution we've talked about on the show so many times. It's like, are we really gonna get to this point where we're gonna just take the next step and put fucking a computer on a, a phone on our face yep. and just have it attached to our face all day? Yep. Do we really want to go down this road? Yep. It's kind of we're at this crossing point. You know, I feel like we've just accepted technology and all the new gadgets, but yep. some point we got to kind of as humans look around and be like, all right, guys, this is probably a little too much. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's all right. It's like, I find it hard to believe that that will, will become mainstream because even to this day, Oh, be careful. Well, I know, but think, think about this. Some guy, somebody's going to clip this up in 30 years and just somebody will clip this up in two weeks and be ranting about yeah, something yeah, probably. But, uh, but when you think about, uh, just like, just like air buds, AirPods. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 
nobody wants to be that guy at the airport that's like having an argument for like call somebody and is on their airport. The douchebag business guy. Yeah. And then he's like having an argument with somebody pacing back and forth for everybody to hear. Yeah. Nobody likes that guy. Yeah. And so then when I think about that same guy <laughs> with goggles on <laughs> with his the face. goggles on and running his hands up and, you know, uh, having that same kind of, yeah, nobody, somebody's going to just, <laughs> somebody's just going to push that guy down the escalator. Yeah. Because that's, no, we don't need that. Yeah. I think it'll be a long time before that's yeah. accepted. Yeah. So, yep. Ah, uh, let's see. Oh, this is right up your alley because I didn't take any steps. So what steps did you take to start your meat business, specifically marketing? I'm struggling to get leads for my business right now. Yeah, I, this is this and I'm, this is something that I'm working on every single day inside farmer grade because I'm, I'm actually reading good source of trying to learn leads is there's a really good book out there, $100 million leads by Alex Ramosi. Alex Ramosi is like probably the, one of the top business minds on social media right now. Highly recommend you check out that book and check that out. But I could just speak on the experience I've had so far. I think when it comes to starting your marketing plan, I would definitely, you got to start with a good product. You got to start with a solid product. It doesn't have to be perfect in the beginning, but it's got to be good enough that it's, you know, it can sell, right? And you can always improve on the product as you progress. And then I would say you got to have a, you got to have a good looking website. You got to have a, a website that gets people to convert. You know, you don't want it to be, you know, you want it to be professional. You want it to be easy to use so people can easily use it and easily shop on it. And then I would say organic, because this is all, all this, the, sh the, the all this is fairly, this isn't like paid advertising yet. We're not into that. This is just getting a good product, getting a good website. Yeah, the website's going to cost you money and develop, developing a product's going to cost you money, but that's just the realities of business. When it gets to the marketing side of things, I recommend organic, trying to come up with an organic growth strategy, organic content strategy that you can post on your own social media, your own business social media that works. For me, what's been really working, if you go look at Farmer Grades Instagram, what I've started to do is I've started to pack people's orders, you know, and like, show them their meat order and like that works for me and what I'm doing. And I, it, it's really worked. And that was a piece of content that I was like, wow, that really worked. I'm going to do more of that. And so I've kind of, you know, diversified a little bit more, adding more elements of organic, different types of content inside organic content. And like, we've got a lot of leads just organically through what we're already posting. And it also helps on the organic side when you have your own personal brand or a brand that you're already associated with that can help market and bring leads that way. Like we're doing here at barn talk, like we're doing at this will do farm. Um, so that also helps a lot. Uh, and I'm just kind of laying this out step by step because you kind of asked for the steps. Um, and then I would say Facebook and Instagram ads, you know, that's something that I'm learning every single day. And there's a lot of agencies out there and people out there that know that better than probably you do, but you can learn anything. So if you put your time into it, you can learn it. But um, Facebook and Instagram ads, they're timeless. It's its one of the most, I mean, the t biggest companies in the entire world spend a lot of money through Facebook ads. I mean, everybody's marketing on Facebook um, and they're getting so good with AI technology. They know exactly who to target and where to target and all that stuff. So that's where I would probably move next. And then email marketing, you got to get a, build an email marketing team to build up your email list and market people that come to your website, Google AdWords, and then I would say YouTube ads. So those are all kind of things you can do. And that's all digital. That's not, that's not going to pop-ups. That's not going to, you know, like in my case, farmer market, farmer's markets. That's not, not me going into restaurants and trying to wholesale my product. There's another, there's a bunch of other ways, but when you're talking about digital media, that would, that's the way I'm going to go about it. You know, that's the way I'm going to go about it. Um, kind of start at your cheapest first. And as you continue to sell more, get more into paid ads and just kind of develop a well-oiled marketing machine. It's kind of where, where my head's at. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of good ways to get leads and there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in those steps. I kind of made it sound super simple, but when you talk about offers and you talk about, you know, sales and you talk about discounts and you talk about 
uh, times of the year. Like there's so many, so many things that go into all those steps. Um, but that's kind of the steps that I think will help you get on the path of knowing what the hell to do. Cause that's part of the thing that I think sucks about business is it, when you don't know what to do next, that's the hardest part. Like when you get to a crossroad inside your business and you're like, what the hell do I do from here? That sucks. I hate that feeling. But at least when you know what to do, then you just got to do it. And that that's, I like doing that way more than not knowing where to go. So the only thing that I'll add to everything that you've said, because most of it, I don't do anything with, but um, when you get somebody that comes to your site, you have to start with the idea that you are going to make the process of somebody buying your product as smooth as possible. Because if you, if you have gotten, like if you've gotten somebody to come to your site, like you, that's the hardest. Well, actually no, getting them to buy it is the hardest, but one of the hardest things is you've got them like 95 yards. You've got them to your site. But if you don't make that experience of buying your product smooth and have a website that's not glitchy and that is well laid out, you want it to where when they get there and they they look at that product, from the time they look at that product to put it in their cart to checking it out to doing their payment information to having the confirmation that it's ordered and going to ship, like that is something that you've got to spend the time to make sure that that works because Mm -hmm. nothing there's a lot of people and i i've looked at this you know i'll i'll look at a product or something and i'll go to a website and if it is crap to navigate i'm out i'm out look i mean amazon screwed amazon screwed everybody because it's so yeah amazon's not the most aesthetically pleasing looking website but when you talk about getting people to convert they can get people to convert like that so easy they've made it so easy for you to purchase and like you you can't get to that level because you know you got to spend a lot of money to make that happen there's a lot of code and stuff that goes into that but there you can make it happen you can definitely make it easy to navigate and i would just say the other thing that helps bring sales is referrals and so that gets back to your product you can do all this marketing and get all these leads but If your product isn't good enough and people aren't coming back to buy it, then you'll always be in this hamster wheel having to market and market and market to new people. And you're getting nobody that you've already purchased to buy again. And that's a bad place to be because you'll end up just marketing your whole life. And companies aren't like that. There's, you got to have a mix of new business and a mix of, of customers that not only keep buying from you that, but also tell their friend and bring customers. And that's, that's free marketing right there. So that gets back to product. So got to find this balance of marketing and trying to make your product better and getting repeat customers and referrals. It's a, it's a wicked, it's a business is a, there's a lot of elements going to it, but so how do you keeps do it fun? It? How do you do it? So the next question is, well, I got to ask you a question. Okay. All right. I got to oh, ask right. you a question. Yeah, there is another question. Yeah, I was going to just jump right. Yeah. On. You were just jonesing, huh? <sighs> So Matt asks, is there any new technology in barn construction that combines free-to-roam theory with standard confinement type facilities? Geothermal heat, separating manure, solar backup, etc. Wow. Yes. I have some thoughts on that. Yes. Uh, so it's funny how there is a saying in the construction world as far as ag, the like in the hog business, and I'm sure it's the same for other ones, that uh, there are no new ideas. Like, stuff is just recycled. And so, you, just as an example, your geothermal uh, idea, the finisher that my dad built in 1972, it had hot water floor heat in it. It was sloped, two sloped floors, slats in the middle, and they put piping in the concrete and it ran to a boiler and the idea was that they were going to heat it that way uh instead of having to put in forced air heaters and all that and it worked okay until the concrete shifted enough and the pipes 
uh, started to leak and then they never used it. I don't know how many years that took. Um, I sold a nursery to a guy up, uh, I want to say kind of up by maybe Troy Mills that he, he poured, he built a nursery with concrete slats and he poured the slats himself and within them he put PEX pipe and he did basically like guys do with shop floors and he hooked all of that together and he had hot water floor heat in this nursery and that was his idea that it was going to be. The problem was that you didn't have to, you didn't have to exhaust near as much air because you didn't have that cycle of pumping hot air in and then it cooling off and getting hot cooling off which was good except because your air exchange wasn't as much um the floor sweat and you had humidity problems and the pens were messy and all that so there's all of that to say that uh there's all kinds of ideas on how to make buildings better more efficient um, better for the pigs the large pen design or the free to roam design there was a time in the hog business uh mid 90s late 90s i would say um jbs with cargill at the time but jbs today they really got big into um basically what we called uh scale barns where there, there really wasn't much for penning. You ran these really large groups of pigs and they had to go through a scale to get into what they called the food court and all the pigs just mingled and it was a big uh, free-to-roam uh, model. The problem that they had with it was that it was hard for anybody if you had pigs that got... Uh, that had health issues that you had to sort out. It was difficult to sort them out. And then there was actually problems with them. They would, you actually had more leg problems. You had more injuries because the pigs would get all riled up and they would take off running from one end of the barn to the other. And if you've ever seen a bunch of pigs take off running, they're really good on the acceleration part. They're not very good on stopping and they kind of it's kind of like watching it's kind of like, stampede yeah and it's kind of like watching turkeys land when they fly they don't really land they just they just stall out and then they crash and that's kind of what pigs do they just kind of they either skid on their butt or they run into somebody anyway they had a lot of leg problems and they burn so much energy running around that their average daily gain actually suffered i think is our either their average daily gain suffered or their feed efficiency wasn't as good because they they were basically burning too much energy instead of converting that to uh weight um there we have some ideas that we'd like to try as far as as we as we grow our business and we have more control over how we raise our pigs i mean we have some ideas that we'd like to try but um you got to have a budget to try it because and you got to have a market and you got to have a market for it. Um, the other thing is we're definitely going to separate manure. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while and we get closer every week, but there's an awful lot of, there's an awful lot of ducks in a row, a lot of, uh, the science side and the algorithm side and just, um, there's a lot more to it than what we thought, and we're getting closer every week, but we will be separating manure here at our our facilities, and we'll let you know how that goes. Mm -hmm. But um, I think people, people are always trying to make the environment better for the animal because a pig that is happy, healthy, better air, better water, uh, better ventilation is going to grow better. Um, so that's, that's something... The problem is, and this is what the push back and forth, you know, you got all the people that are going to get on and the haters are going to say they need to be outside. Well, there, there's a reason why we put them inside and it's because we tried to control the environment because it was better for the pig uh, when conditions were adverse. And then the other side of it is to try to, to, try to produce food at scale. It's very difficult to do 
uh, outside. And if you're worried about your carbon footprint, turning thousands ahead of hogs, in our case, on dirt uh, is very carbon intensive if you're worried about that kind of thing. So uh, definitely the most efficient and the best for the environment, uh, snarky comments welcome, is uh, put them inside. Because mm-hmm. you can control as many of the controllables as possible. It has the small, the smallest uh, climate footprint or smallest carbon footprint by putting them inside. Yeah, Ooh. I would say. I think the the ways that you can get better is separate manure and that make it even more um, carbon neutral. Hell, even carbon negative and better for the environment. Um, solar, we're already doing solar. I mean, that's that's kind of being done and that's being done around here more and more uh, because it makes sense for us yep. here in this area. But yeah, I think a big comment we always see for, from people is just, you know, they, they want, they either will say the pigs are too crowded or they'll say, do they ever see outside? Do ever they go out? Do they ever go outside? Do I ever see the outside? It's like, so I don't know. Sometimes I just, I wonder if there's a way that we're not thinking about doing something on that side of things because it's just, that's what the consumers, from all the videos we post, that's what consumers say. That's what people say. And yeah, you got the snarky, uh, what do you say, vile vegans that like to come at you and just doesn't matter what you do, it's bad in their in their eyes. But You're you know, there's people out there that, I think there's, there's, there is merit with what the consumer has to say. And the consumer ultimately buys the product. So if they're saying something, then it, we would be stupid not to listen to them a little bit. But I also get you have to raise the animal. We know we're farmers. You know, we live it every day. We got we to gotta, we gotta kind of manage both sides of that best mm-hmm. you can. You got to grow an animal. It's got to be efficient. But you also, there's, I think there's room to listen to the consumer on that, on those side of things, on that side of things. So anyway, that's all I'll say. Currently today, the only way that our pigs get outside is if I load them up five at a time in my Jeep and drive yep. around the block and then put them the five back yep. and get five more. Yep. There just isn't they enough love hours. That. They do love it. Uh, yeah. If you've ever seen a dog with his head out the window, that's nothing compared to a pig. They just love it. Bacon is, that bacon on those pigs tastes the best. It does, yep. Especially if you give them one of those little pinwheel things. And just let them hold hold. it outside. Yep, they put that in their little dew claw and... uh, (laughs) They love that shit. Oh, they love it. Yeah. They're the best. Those those do tend to taste the best. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. We might be. Now, my favorite, my my favorite taking them outside is when they go to the locker. Yes. And then end up at the freezer. That's... I like that. Tasty. That's real tasty. Hey, thanks for sticking with us. We appreciate every single one of you guys. Let's keep this ball rolling. Leave a review on Spotify or Apple. Follow us on YouTube. Uh, Pay the fee. Share it out with who you know. It all helps, guys. We appreciate every single one of you. We love you. Now, let's get back to the podcast. Yeah, and so that ties right into my next question because that's very labor-intensive. And so the question is, how do you guys balance everything between social media, farming, meat business and personal i have a really hard time feeling like all i do is work any tips or advice would be appreciated uh no we (laughs) we we are piss poor we're piss poor at that so uh we don't have any good advice to give you other than you're not alone and we feel the same way (laughs) all right nope go ahead yeah what's your thoughts uh i actually had an epiphany this week you know I i was doing some reflecting this week and just yeah, I would definitely say don't no, you're not alone in that. Um, that it's really hard when it's hard to not work all the time and feel like you need to work all the time and it, you know you got stuff to do and you want to get it done and you want to try to go to the next level and you want to try to better better yourself and better your family and setting yourself up for the future and like that's always at the forefront of our minds. You know that's our heartbeat of why we do what we do, um, but. I talked to my older brother the other day. He's a little bit older than me. And I asked him, you know, because sometimes I feel like, and I'm going to get kind of deep here, but sometimes I feel like I don't enjoy the the little things in life as much. Like my my fiance, Kat, she is amazing at enjoying the little things at life. in life. She will, she'll like just the littlest shit and get the, the, just get the chuckle out of it. And for me, 
I have a hard time really. I don't know if it's not not because I'm in the moment or if it's I'm just so burned out from the work day or I'm just thinking about all the ideas and stuff that we got to get done or on to the next project that I don't sit and really soak up life, you know? And some, you know, I was just doing some reflecting this week and my brother said, you got to put up boundaries with your work, you know, and, th- and I've been really sh- doing a piss poor job at that. You know, most of the time we work weekends, most, most every day we got something to do and we really don't set boundaries with our work very too, too much. I mean, I'm probably the worst out of it. You used to be that way when you were running and gunning when you were young, but you've gotten a little bit better as you've gotten older, which you know, that's to, that's to, to be expected, especially when you got no kids in the house. But for me, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do, we're trying to do all this stuff. And, you know, I think it's important to, to want to go after more and, and do more, but I also feel like I'm really sucking and put in and enjoying the little day, everyday life. And, you know, like a boundary that I'm going to try to set is, you know, having one day of the week where I just, enjoy put the phone down put it on do not disturb don't even take it with me and just enjoy my time and enjoy my time with cat and not think about the next project or what i got to do tomorrow or who i need to call or what's got to get done because the work's always going to be there and you have to you have to just set that phone down i think and set up boundaries with your work um Cause yeah, like I said, honestly, it's, I just need to do more of that. I'm not, I feel like I'm kind of, I wouldn't say empty, but when I'm not thinking about business and doing that stuff, I'm super passionate about, sometimes I feel like I put all my energy in that. When I'm not in that, I don't have much to give to everything else. And that's a problem. That's definitely a problem. And that's definitely not the way I want my life to be forever. Right. Right. And then it's really hard because you're in this, we're in this age now where you're a young guy and you're getting told like, you know, you guys have it so, you know, you guys got it so easy and like you haven't had to go to war and, you know, you have the David Goggins and the Andy Fursellas and the Jocko Wilkings and you have all these guys telling you to just shut up and put your nose to the grindstone and embrace the suck, embrace the suck and don't be a, don't be a pussy. Right. And just kick ass and take names. And like, I can get behind that. And like a lot of time I live that, but at the same time, do you want to have a family? Do you want to have a personal life? Do you want to enjoy life? Because, you know, something that I've seen and heard and watched is a lot of billionaires, a lot of successful, wealthy people, their biggest regret is they didn't spend more time with the people that they love the most. That's their biggest regret. Number one regret. You know, if they could take if they could take some of it back, they would they would spend more time with their family. And so that's that's all you got to hear right there. So I'm not perfect in this category at all. We do a good job, do a pretty good job getting the work done. But for me personally, I do a terrible job at doing anything else. To be honest. I mean, that's be the reality. And I'm trying to work on that best I can. But I am flawed through and through on that deal. Yeah. Well, I think that's the single biggest. We've talked about this many times, but time management is that is the difference between success and failure. I think for I think for anything that you're doing, if you are working for yourself, if you if you are if you own your own business or you're building your own business, building your own brand, time management is that's the hardest thing because you're only accountable to yourself and it is so easy. It is so easy to lose time. Like when you sit down, you sit down to reply to an email. Okay, I'm going to reply to this email. But then you reply to that email and there's two other emails there. And then that reminds you of something that you saw or you're curious whether how this post is doing or whatever. And the next thing you know, replying to that email has cost you 40 minutes. And it's, it is just, oh man, it's tough. It's tough. And like we, we have run the gauntlet of, um, 
having our having our calendars, having everybody in the family, you know, on a calendar and having our priorities and oh, every Sunday night we're going to have a we're going to have a plan for the following week and we're going to plan and we're going to do this this day, this this day, this this day. And uh yep, usually by Tuesday it's shot. Well, it's really hard when cuz the the thing that throws the biggest wrench in it all is the pigs because if pigs got to be loaded or pigs got to get unloaded or pigs get out of their pen or yep, pigs, uh, get pigs, sick. pigs get sick. I mean, throws you off. Yeah. So you, you can't, you can't do anything about that. Um, I think the single biggest tool that I use every single day that's helped me tremendously the most. And I was one of these kids, you know, they always gave you a planner in school. I said, fuck that planner. I never used that thing ever, 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 which I probably should have. Cause I could have, I could have probably used it, but I plan pretty much everything that I got to do all the time. Anytime somebody calls me with something, or anytime I want to remind myself of something, or anytime I'm thinking about what I need to get done, I use the app called Things Things Two. I think it's called Things Two. It's the Things app, dude. You can schedule out days. You can schedule out stuff you got to do in each day. You can have your to do list for the whole day. You can have. Projects. Se- projects where you can write out, okay, this is what I want to do for farmer grade launch, whatever. And these are the, this is the checklist I want to get done. Or, I mean, there's, you can write notes. You can, you can do so much stuff inside that app and it keeps me so organized, way more organized where, than what I was before. And it keeps me on track for sure, for sure. So I would recommend that to anybody when it comes to time management, but yeah, man, it is a struggle. And I also think at the end of the day, you got to you gotta do some reflecting on what life do you want? Because I can get, for me personally, I get caught up in wanting to, you know, just wanting to, wanting to do it all, wanting to have it all, wanting to have an amazing operation, wanting to maybe make the farm look awesome and have all the nice stuff. And I want to have a successful business and I want to do all these amazing things. But then are you going to have the people that you love spending time with the most around to see it all because all you did was work. I mean, that, you got to, you got to think about those, that stuff because it's just people make life. I think people make life worth living. And so if you, all you do is work, you're, you're going to, you're going to be unfulfilled at the end of the day. Um, so I don't know. And this is, it's something that I struggle with every day. So I, I'm no expert by any means. Yeah. And another part of that, not to beat the horse, but, um, eliminate people. So people make life work. People make life worth living. Then there's another group of people that make life miserable. So people that aren't, helping you, people that aren't lifting you up, people that don't share your vision or at least understand your vision and support it, you got to get rid of those people. Oh, yeah. You got to get rid of those people. thousand percent group. Because it, life's too short. Your time's too valuable. You do not have time to spend either defending yourself or trying to sell what you're trying to do to somebody for their approval. You got to get... Single best decision I ever made was stop valuing people's opinions about me. You know, you want a good reputation of being an honorable man and being a respectable man, but there are just toxic, toxic ass people out there that just want you to fail. And so those people get them out of your life and don't give a shit about it. And the people that talk shit about you for about doing what you want to do, let them talk shit because that's... They're going to do that regardless. They're going to talk shit if you win or they're going to talk shit if you don't win. So just let them talk shit and let let go of people's opinions. And I'll also say last thing on this, we're beating the shit out of this dead horse right now. <laughs> but I will just say this. The other thing that I think about is family's important, people are important, but also having a mission and having a purpose in this life is important and creating value in the world is important. And so that's why I'm so passionate about doing what we're doing because I feel like we're creating value and we have a purpose and it's really easy to get caught up and passionate about that. And I think that's good, yep. but I just think I'm out of bound. I'm out of whack with it too much yep. where I feel like I'm all in on that all the time and I'm, I'm lacking in this, in this area. And I think also there's, there's something to be said about seasons in life. 
I'm 24, mm-hmm. you're 50, and you're in your 50s, so it's a little bit different dynamic. And so I'm hoping as things progress that I can kind of balance those two things out more. Um, still have a purpose, still have something I'm going for, still provide value to the world, hopefully build a team of like-minded thinking people that are passionate about going after something, and then also have a life behind just that too. Yeah. So anyway. That's good. That horse is dead as shit now. Yep. Yep. Starting to stink. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Do you use all the power that your solar panels make on your hog barn? What happens to the extra? Do you get paid if you overproduce? Yeah. So we have two systems. We have a 60, I think we got a 60 KW system at my two barn site, and we have 90 KW down here at home. Um, and so we do overproduce, um, and every, I think every large utility today does this the same way and it's, it's a shitty deal. Um, and utility companies don't care about their customers very much. I'll argue that with whoever wants to argue it because, when I put my first solar system in, the extra power that I produced during daylight hours got sent up the line, and I got credited. So the meter, if, you, if you've if you ever seen a meter uh, that is solar, you can tell because there's, at the bottom, when you're using power, there's a little arrow, and that arrow, it's a little dotted line, and the arrow moves across, and if you have a solar meter or a meter set up for it, uh, it goes both ways. So if you're producing, the arrow goes one way. I'm really oversimplifying it. There's all kinds of things on that meter that'll tell you different things. But at the end of the day, if you're sending power up the line, you're overproducing. You're making more power than what you're using at your site. You're sending it up the line. And they credited me on my bill at the rate that they paid for power. So they credited me the same rate that they bought power from some other utility. So that was a really good deal. And the way it worked was I accumulated credits throughout the year. And then in the fall, when we would start drying corn, my my drying bin is at the site where we have uh, this one of the solar systems. So then I would burn those credits up and unless we had a really wet year or really cold year, I could just about dry all my corn as far as the electricity part of it is um, off of that credit that I had. And then uh, I would have a little bit of bill, a little bit of a bill going into spring because I'd used up all my credits and you're not producing near as much solar during the winter. So I would have a bill, but still pretty decent. It was a really great deal. And then we did the same thing down here, but... Today, when you put on solar, they credit you at the interstate transmission rate, which that is the price that they get for the power that they sell. That's not, you don't get credited for the rate that they pay for power. You get credited for the rate that they sell power to other utilities, which you can make the argument, you know, you're, an, you're a utility and you're you're selling it. And that's neither here nor there, but it's not near as good of a, it's not near as good of a deal and your credits don't add up as quickly. And so for us, the next step in what we want to do is basically power walls. Maybe it's not Tesla. I think it probably will be Tesla power walls. I want to put enough battery storage at both of my sites that the extra that I produce during the day, I bank them here. I don't bake them with the utility. And then at night, I draw that power out. And if I do need any power, then I pull it out of the grid from the utility company. But I'm basically using the utility company as my backup. That's my goal. Um, The cost of batteries, the quality of batteries has gotten a lot better, um, especially when it comes to the energy storage. Um, And that's that's the direction that we want to go. It's not cheap, but in the long run, I think it's worth it because in the time that I've had solar 
the rate I'm paying has gone up. Oh, I'm sure it's gone up over. I bet you it's gone up fifty percent. I I should look and see what it what it is, and it's going to continue to go up. It, it just it just is, and so basically for us, solar's been a hedge because we spent that money, and there's a cost involved. But what what my electricity is actually costing me from solar versus what I'm buying on the grid off the grid, the solar is way more economical. So. Um, I hope that answers your question. I feel the power. Yeah, feel the power. I'd love to have, yeah, like I want... Uh, five. I like independence and sticking it to Yeah, people. and that's the other thing. That's what I like about it is... Um, Why not produce your own power and only right. need the utility company when you need them? Yeah. I like it. Keep Let's that get power on that. For, Let's keep, get on that. Keep that power for the upcoming... When you say expensive, how expensive is that? batteries oh gosh dang it um well if you don't know don't say out something that you don't know yeah i'm not gonna throw it out there because i've looked at it umpteen times and i i can't tell you so like in tesla's case they're on power wall three i think and the cost has come down a little bit but so if you would have needed like three units before you can get the amount of storage per unit has grown a lot. So you're getting a lot more storage for the dollar you spend. So it's getting more economical all the time. I don't know what it is, but yeah, it'd be nice to have that stored up for the upcoming struggle. Yep. The EMP. <laughs> uh, are we adding any new equipment or building projects in 2024? Well, uh, we are going to be hopefully building a manure separating facility here in 2024 uh that's that's our goal uh i think i'd love to have a what do you call it <sighs> warehouse call it? oh where? warehouse uh forklift oh yeah i'd like to get a forklift yep i know that's not farm equipment but it's warehouse equipment i'd like to get a forklift make our life a little bit easier so we don't have to haul the skiddy into into the warehouse every time we need to get something off a truck. Yep. That'd be really nice to get. Yeah. Uh, those are definitely the, that's the biggest project. Is freezer truck would happen to help yeah. too. I'd take, a, I'd take a freezer truck if I could find one that was decent price. Decent price, but those do not go for cheap. So No, they don't. Um, no farm equipment though, I don't think. Nope. We're just trying to hold our money together. If uh, any of you out there that are grain farming have done your uh, cash flows for the year based on, uh, I think I ran my last one at $4, $4.50 corn and corn closed at four four oh six today. And it didn't work all that great at four fifty, And so I doubt it works any better at four oh six, probably a lot worse actually. So <laughs> I don't think there's a whole lot of money in there for uh, any new equipment. And we still got to fix all the old stuff. Uh, this coming week, the Amish that put the quality roof on this barn, uh, there's a great video showing the Amish putting the roof on our barn here for Barn Talk. And uh, the video is good, but the comments are even better because, I don't know. The fucking Amish are running power tools. How the fuck are they running power tools? <laughs> yeah, that ain't it, real Amish. Those aren't Amish. Those are not real Amish. Not real Amish. Uh, Amish stealing jobs from Americas. Don't fucking pay taxes. Don't pay taxes. Don't have workman's comp. I mean, the hatred for the Amish is... I did not understand how vast and wide the hatred for the Amish You either are. really love them or you really hate them, yep. I guess. Because there's people that love their work. Yep. I love their work. Did I tell the potato joke on the podcast? Have I ever told that? I don't know. I'm the wrong person to ask because I've okay, heard, well, I've heard I've told it this, so many times. If I've told this, just 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 disregard. But I have to tell it every time we talk about the Amish. So uh, these two Amish ladies are out uh, digging potatoes, and uh, the one Amish lady says the other one, she's like, "These potatoes remind me of my husband's testicles." And the other one stops and looks. She goes, "Oh my, they're that big." And she goes, "No, they're that damn dirty." <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'll, <laughs> sorry, I had to say that. But anyway, uh, they're coming next week. The Amish crew's coming because my oldest hog building, the fan end walls, are rotten out. Uh, so when we built those, the product that we used, and I feel kind of guilty about this because I really believed in it, and I sold a shitload of hog buildings that all had the same design, um, but the 
the siding around the fans, as soon as the caulking started to crack at all, uh, it drew moisture, and my fan end walls are in real bad shape. So we're going to uh, pull the fans out, tear the walls down, and redo them. And now then they'll be uh, metal sided. And then, you know, if you've seen the zip system, the way they wrap windows in residential homes, it's the same kind of deal. They use that wrap, uh, that that foil wrap, and then um, steel over it. And we're putting a little bit of a, oh, basically making that you just can't get any water in there. That'll probably be the biggest building deal we do other than the manure separator what about these old asshole hog barns we ever gonna get them torn down Gosh, them fucking things are ugly to look at i'd like to i'd like to are we gonna like can we come up with a realistic game plan on that that's how i think about tickets? time you buy lottery tickets lately? Yeah. yeah the worst thing about that is time so uh we've got three old hog buildings here uh one was built in 72 and the other ones were built in 75 and 76 and four foot pits under them uh the oldest barn has a 10 foot pit but man you start you can get rid of a building well, that's one thing i will say about um hog confinement or if you build a cattle barn or anything like that getting rid of the building pretty easy getting rid of all that concrete that that's a problem because i mean it is it is a pile. I busted out all the concrete divider walls, and you should see the pile of concrete that I've got just from that. And when we start busting the floors out and the pit walls and all that, uh, I think we need a pretty good size track hoe for that. And uh, yeah. a lot of time. Yep. A lot of time or the budget to just go, Oh, uh, yeah. Hey, <laughs> make it go away. <laughs> One eight hundred. Get rid of my fucking problem. Yep. Yeah. How many fat hogs can you put on a semi, and how many loads are in one of your finishers? How many loads of feed does it take? Yes. So we get we get questions like this a lot on the farm. This is, should be rapid for you. Yep. So uh, on average, we put one hundred and sixty two pigs on a semi. Depends. If they're really big, we'll put one fifty five. If you're selling them and they're two fifty, two sixty, they'll put one sixty five. But it also depends if it's summertime. So 162 is a good round number. I think most truckers can. I think most truckers can get around that. 162, good number. Um, we sell our pigs anywhere between. Really, we try to start 280, 290, somewhere in there. Uh, depends on what packer they're going to. Um, as far as feed goes, easy figuring. Uh, a fat hog will eat about 700 pounds of feed to go from wean to finish. So on a 2,400 head finisher, 24 ton to a load, that's like 35 loads of feed that you got to haul in there. Oh, yeah. And so then when you haul all the pigs out, I think it's 16 loads. So each 2,400 head finisher, uh, I think there's 16 loads of pigs in there to come out. And it takes 35 loads of feed to make that. So uh, thank God for truckers, and that is, if you drive around the countryside in southeast Iowa and you see all these trucks, you think about all the corn that has to be hauled from the field to the bin, from the bin either to the river or to a, a feed mill, and then all that corn gets ground with bean meal that got hauled from Cedar Rapids or the Quincy, Illinois, or wherever, and hauled back out and then all those pigs get hauled takes a lot should have bought stock in a tire company i think yeah <laughs> we're just sort of making them somebody should be making a lot of money off truck tires because agriculture only works because of transportation yeah there's a lot of moving pieces and people just people don't realize it they think it's just grown at the grocery store yep it shows up somehow and uh, not to not to rain on everybody's parade today, and this is not a hot topics, but uh, if you're worried about all the people flooding our borders that could do us harm, uh, it does not take any people are like, oh, there's going to be, you know, uh, somebody's going to blow up the Super Bowl or somebody's going to do this. Uh, you don't have to blow up very many 
uh, bridges or train tracks or anything in this country, and you would bring this country to its knees in a hurry because if transportation can't happen, people don't eat, uh, power doesn't stay on, all kinds of bad things happen. So it does not have to be anything fancy. We are so reliant on transportation that that, to me, is the weakest link. You know, way to go. Give them ideas. Womp, womp, womp. Just gave them all our, I'm pretty sure, all our secrets. I'm sure that... We're uh, doomed now. The deviant <laughs> bastards in the world don't need me. There, I <laughs> will just bet that there's not one deviant son of a bitch out there that goes, huh, well, that's a really good idea. Yeah. I think I'll do that. I think well, already- I think some of them, though, they probably think, well, we don't want to take out America's food supply because we we need some of that, too. Uh, I don't know. I they can't I get on know. a barge. True. Can't get on a barge. They take out the semi. I know. That's true. I so, don't know. I hope that we're... I hope that the people that are on top of it are really on top of it because it's a mess. Yep. Okay. I think that's all. I think that's all she wrote. You got any other thoughts? I do have another thought. Uh, tell me, have any of you, any of you out there that have Apple TV, been watching Masters of the Air, which is about the uh, bombing of Germany in World War II? It is the story of a squadron of uh, B twenty sixes, I think out flying out of England and it is it is done so well the attention to detail is fantastic and my dad was a fighter pilot in World War II he flew a P-51 he was in the 325th Air Force uh, 318th fighter squadron they flew out of Lucina, Italy and they would fly up out of Italy and meet the bombers coming over from England so like that whole series is pretty near and dear to me because, you know, we used to talk about that a lot. But um, just from, you know, his stories and, like, I had his flight jacket, his captain's hat, and all that stuff. And just the attention to detail is amazing. And I would say, you know, we're in hard times. Uh, a lot of people, it is not getting any easier. But when you, when you see... I think that that I think that the the way they portray it and the number of people that get that die throughout the series that are main characters uh you get a real feel for how the sacrifice that uh that those guys made and yeah great series yeah I haven't finished it yet we were watching it as a family and then you know, life happens. time and life happens. And so Kat and I are going to probably finish it. But I watched the first two episodes and I got Band of Brothers vibes. Just, oh yeah, more updated and Air Air Force. Yeah. So it's, but yeah, it's definitely badass for sure. I, <laughs> what did I say? The opening, like the opening intro to that show. I just was like, after it, it was like a long intro and it's just like pure blood Amer- American. It's just fucking yeah. screams American. Nothing could have made it better. And after it like showed, I think the first episode I watched the intro, I was like, fucking love America. I was like, I just love fucking America. And everybody just started yeah. laughing because it's, it's a really good, it's just, you know, and there's something about that, you know, fighting for your country and just a, a cool ass cut scene and an intro of just the montage of American kick assness is just awesome. Yeah. Uh, something that was interesting, and I'd forgotten about this, but when the United States started the daytime, when the United States started the daytime bombing campaign, uh, so England, they were bombing at nighttime, and they did not have the, they did not have the uh, bomb site. They they talk a little bit about it in there, but one of the most closely guarded secrets uh, of the American war machine, I guess you'd say, was the optic that they used, the bomb site that the bombardier used to know when they were over the target that they could precisely drop the bombs. And when I say precisely, there was a hell of a lot of munitions that were dropped that didn't hit anywhere near what they were supposed to hit. However, they were much more accurate than what had been before. And the English, they were bombing at night and they were just indiscriminately bombing. Um, and there's a scene in there where the British pilots are basically just telling these guys that they're crazy, that they're just absolutely crazy because 
you had to deal with the fighters. You had to deal with the flack. Um, I mean, it was, you know, they basically told him it was suicide. And and the when they started the average, you had to fly. You had to fly uh, twenty. 25 missions, I think, before you could come home. And like, it was quite a while before there was a, there was a group that made 25 missions. And side note, my dad being a fighter pilot, you had to fly 50 missions, uh, if you were a fighter pilot. So that tells you the reason is because your life expectancy was a lot greater as a fighter pilot than you were as the, uh, as the crew in a B-26 or B-24. Anyway, just... Whew, it's enough to uh, drive you to drinking. <laughs> yeah. Oh, nice tie-in. So today, uh, we're going to have a whiskey minute. And whiskey! <laughs> we, need, we, we need a song or something. Jingle. <laughs> yeah. And you're not singing it. Yeah. It's I, not going to be you. No, thanks. Uh, we have 1792 uh, small batch. And this is this is kind of like, it's kind of entry level. Uh, it's got a fancy bottle, and they make small batch. They make full proof, and they make. Uh, there's one more. I can't remember what the other one is, but this is like. Uh, it's a Barton's product, which is Sazerac, and it's like the illegitimate brother of Buffalo Trace. It's all kind of the same. And I think these guys kind of get a bad rap because they're not they're not on the right side of the family tree, Bartons. But they're the uh, redheaded stepchild. Yeah, kind of. They but they do make a fancy bottle, um, and small batch is only like ninety three proof, so it doesn't have much burn to it. The full proof's like one hundred and twenty five. It's got a little more zip to it. Um, I would say there's no age statement on it. Uh, there used to be an age statement on it, and then they sold enough of it that. It, I think now it's like six and a half years old. But um, I've had it before. This is actually the second bottle that, excuse me, that I had. And um, I've never had it. You already had a little, didn't you? No, I just pured oh. myself one. Oh, you got. I wanted it. to make it smooth for everybody at home. Yeah, right. I wanted you to be able to highlight the bottle and not have to worry about giving me nothing. It smells really good. Uh, it's you know it's kind of fruity, kind of caramely, um, but it's not. I guess you'd say it's not, it's not finished like uh, that. Is quite the pour, dude. You're you're not gonna down that whole thing, are you? Well, I don't know. I I didn't pay much attention. Well, I, now you made me self conscious. No, you're gonna I go ride a bull after this. I probably won't drink it all, but uh, I it actually, like I said, I've had it before. It's, I'd I'd say it's good enough. Like I wouldn't use it for a mixer. It's good enough that you can sip it neat, but it's not it's not the best whiskey in the world. Mm. But it's also not that expensive and you can find it and yeah, it's it's different. Um I I kind of like the front end of it. Uh but the back really drops off fast. Look at me talking like I'm talking God, you're, you like I'm a You're a connoisseur guy. here. Anyway, I ain't shit. I don't know nothing. I just know you just know this either burns, burns me slow, or, pretty, or burns me fast. Right there, you go. There's, so it either it's burning me either way. Cheers to enjoying life. Should we make that? Yeah, the, cheers those? to enjoying life and figuring shit out. Stop killing horses and beating them. Yep, that we got that one. We stopped at one. So what do you think? Well, it didn't burn right away. No, that's that low proof. It's burning now, though. 93 proof, not <clears throat> 93 and a half proof. But it doesn't have, like, it it's smells. not bad. I wouldn't say that's bad at all. It smells better but than it tastes. But it's not the best. Because it doesn't have, like, you can't taste all yeah, the fruit there's not a lot of there's not a lot of flavor, right. I would say. It's but not it, like a Four Roses or anything like that, or like a... But the burn's not too bad. No. And that's, I could drink that on ice. There you go. But you're not going to have a lot of flavor. No. If you're looking for a flavorful whiskey, that ain't it. But if you got somebody that doesn't have much whiskey and doesn't know anything about it, and you want to get them a cool bottle, it is a pretty bottle and it's not going to set you back a whole lot of money. So, hey. I'd rate it a six, a six, seven. There you go. Six, four, six, seven. Actually, I think that's pretty good. I, I, 
the only reason it's above I it average. Was, I saw somebody that did a review on it, and I think they gave them. Uh, I think they gave it a six out of ten. Well, what would you say? I, that's what I would say. Yeah, um, it's it's good enough. Yeah. And let's face it, you only got to have really one good glass of whiskey to start <laughs> yeah. the night. Yeah. And then after that, you can pour whatever you yeah. want because it doesn't it matter. Ain't, it, what ain't the Peaky Blinders prohib- prohibition? We're saving that. That's <laughs> We've got that back on the barrel back here. That's the, We're going to use Woo. that as a freaking Molotov. Throw yeah, that, that would be a good... If shit hits the fan and you're trying to decide what to throw, uh, Bushnell's uh, Prohibition style by the Peaky Blinders, that's going to be the first bottle to get a towel shoved in and <laughs> yeah. chucked into a crowd of thieves or hooligans or whatever because yeah, yeah. it's not that great. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up, guys. So if you got any value from the show, if we made you laugh... If uh, you know you're related to us on something, please share it out or support us at Farmer Grade or leave a review. We appreciate every single one of you guys, and we love you. And we'll see you back here next week for another episode. Bye.